looking out across the congregation this morning, I'm reminded of a story that I heard about a preacher who showed up at service and there was only one person there. And he preached and he preached and he preached and he preached and I think he went on about two hours and after it was over, the old farmer that was there, the only one in attendance, came up to him and said something about him preaching a long time and he was, he was the only one there and he said, well, if you go out to the field and you only have one cow, don't you go ahead and feed that cow? He said, yeah, but I don't try to give him the whole bale of hay. So anyway, I'm not going to try to keep you very long this morning. As Brother Bill says, sounds good, don't mean nothing. I do want to talk to you for a few minutes, not to only those that are here, but those that are listening out there. I noticed this morning over the radio station, we had listeners in about five different countries spread out all over the world. So we have a diverse listening group out there. and I want to drop something in their spirit today that we have talked about here more than once before and it will become very familiar to you as we get into it. It's a subject that we've talked about before. We've mentioned it in other sermons as well. And we're going to look at the, what I feel is about the best example of this that can be given. And of course, it comes from the Word of God. The Lord has a way of bringing things to the surface and letting us know that even though we have talked about things, even though we have preached sermons on these subjects, even though we've covered it over and over again, the Lord has a way of letting us know that we still haven't quite got it. That we still need to go back and look at it again. That it still hasn't become rooted and grounded inside of us. And one of the ways that we know this, that we haven't spent enough time on it, that it is something we need to cover over, that cover again, something we have not heard enough of, is our actions. The things that we do. The way that we act. The things that we say. The world has a saying that says the proof is in the pudding. And what's <laughs> worse is this. If we do understand this, if we do have this, if we do claim to know this, and yet we still don't practice it, well, that's worse than ever. It's worse if you do know and you're not doing it than if you don't know and you continue the same way you're going. So we're going to look at something this morning. You might say, well, what in the world are we going to talk about? For just a very few minutes this morning, I want to talk to you about a subject called mercy. Just for a few minutes. Not so much God's mercy. Not His mercy on us. But our mercy on others. I cannot tell you of the times that I have heard people tell me, speaking of other individuals, well, they deserve what they get. It's all their own fault. They're the reason that they're in this situation. They knew better. And even at times, they will go so far as to say, I'm not going to pray for them anymore. And sometimes I've heard Christians say, well, I'm going to pray that God sends judgment down on them. There's no better example of this than we find in the book of Jonah. Go with me to Jonah. The story of Jonah used many times as a children's story, but it very much applies to our adult life. Jonah, the first chapter and the first verse. The book of Jonah, the first chapter, beginning in the first verse. And we're going to look at Jonah, a man who finds himself in need of God's mercy and how he reacts later on when somebody else needs mercy. I don't think there's one of us out there today, whether you're sitting in here or whether you're out there by way of radio or by way of video, I don't think there's a one of us that can say we have never needed God's mercy. And especially during this time of the year, a lot of the scriptures that we use, the Christmas scriptures we use shows us God's mercy toward us. We know that God has great mercy, but it's our mercy that is lacking. It's not God that is short on mercy, it's man that is short on mercy. And we find a great example of this. We see that the word of the Lord came into Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. Now we see Jonah, a very spiritual, righteous man of God, the prophet of God of that hour. He gets up, the Bible says, but Jonah rose up. Now what did, he, what did he rise up to do? Did he rise up to obey the Lord? No, that's not what we find here. We find Jonah getting up to flee unto Tarshish 
from the presence of the Lord. Now he takes some actions here that maybe many times that we've read this story, we have just brushed over them and we didn't pay a whole lot of attention to them. Maybe we just read it and went on past these facts. The first thing he does is he goes, the Bible says he went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare thereof. He went down into it to go with them from, from uh, unto Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. Now we see here that this is not something that Jonah did just that he messed up. It wasn't that he was backed into a corner and he told what we call a fib, which is actually a lie. Amen? You see, God don't have a list of, well, these are fibs. These are white lies. These are bad lies. No, a lie is a lie. A fib is a lie. But many times people are backed into a corner they feel like they have no other option and they mess up and they lie. Sometimes people who would never use a, a bad word, for some reason they slipped up it's something they hadn't dealt with down deep inside there and it pops up to the surface and they mess up and they use a bad word. I hope I'm not speaking to you, but you know everybody out there has messed up. Maybe you got angry. Maybe in a moment of rage or something you got angry. It was just a, a, a fleeting thing. It wasn't something that you lived in, something that you practiced, but you just messed up. Many times there are things that we do it's not that we live in sin, we just commit an act of sin and we're like, oh no, what did I just do? And we get concerned about that and conviction grips our soul and we repent of it and that's great. But this is not the case with Jonah. Jonah's disobedience was premeditated. It was planned. This wasn't a slip of the tongue or a thought that went in uncaptured, uncaptured or not, not taken into captivity. This was calculated. How do we know this this morning? We know this because, number one, he rose up. He got up. He had to make a decision, number one, to get up. Then he has to make a decision which direction he's going to go in. He went down to Joppa. Then the Bible says he found a ship. So he went looking for a ship. Not one that would take him to Nineveh, but one that would take him to Tarshish. Maybe he came by one that was going to be going to dock closer to Nineveh. And he thought, oh no, I ain't going to go on that one. That one's going in the wrong direction. Maybe he came by another one and said, I'm not going to go on that one. That one's going in the wrong direction. So he premeditatedly goes down and finds him a ship going in the opposite direction of God's word, God's commandment. And at each one of these steps, Jonah could have stopped and said, wait a minute. After he rose up, he could have said, no, wait a minute. I'm going to go to Nineveh like the Lord said. After he went down to Joppa, he could have stopped and said, No, I'm not going to disobey God. I'm going to go to Nineveh like God said. After he found him a ship that was going to go to Tarshish, he could have said, Before he stepped foot on the ship, he said, No, wait a minute. I'm going to go back down here and get on one that takes me closer to Nineveh and obey God's word, but he didn't. And he didn't stop there. The Bible says he paid the fare. Not only did he have to rise up, not only had, did he have to go down to Joppa. Not only did he have to find a ship, then he had to... Let's see here. <clears throat> Pay my fare. I'll get my ticket. All the time knowing that he was not obeying what God told him to do. Jonah didn't just mess up. He premeditatedly... So see, later on, he wouldn't be able to use this, the excuse, Lord, I just goofed up. It was a fleeting moment. It was, a, it was just a moment of, uh, of fault and, and failure on my part. No, he premeditatedly done this. He pays the fare thereof and then he goes, he gets on the ship, he got on board and all, of the, all along he could have changed his mind and said, wait a minute, I'll do what the Lord told me to do. So without a doubt, what is about to come up on Jonah is Jonah's fault. Do you see that this morning? It wasn't anyone else's fault. No one else is involved. The pastor didn't offend him. It wasn't a saint on the pier next to him that made him mad. It wasn't one of his family members. It's just between God and Jonah. So Jonah don't have anybody to blame. You know, if you go house to house this morning, you'll find some people who won't give you an excuse at all. You'll find some people who are down in their back, they're sick, whatever the case may be. And some of them certainly are not able to come to church. Many of them are, and they just don't want to come. But you'll find many people with many excuses. And a lot of times they'll point the finger. Well, I used to go to church. That pastor down there, he said this. That song leader down there, they did this. That bunch of hypocrites down there. So many times you try to blame other people for your mess ups. When it was between you and God 
in your bad decision. Listen what happens. The Bible says he goes down, he pays the fare, he gets on the ship. But thank God the story doesn't end there for Jonah's sake and for the people of Nineveh. The Bible says in verse 4, Jonah the first chapter, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the, great, into the, into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea. Now Lord, the Lord sends out a boomerang. He says, well, you think you're going to run? I'll send something to catch you. <clears throat> so the ship was like to be broken. It's being shook to and fro. The storm is hitting. And these, these fishermen, they begin to cry out to their God. Every man unto his own God. So don't tell who all they was calling out to. And they cast forth their wares so the ship could be lighter. They started getting rid of things that they didn't have to have so that the ship wouldn't be so heavy, so that it wouldn't be so easily to be torn asunder by the storm. So the shipmaster came. Oh, they find Jonah. Where's he at? He's gone down to the sides of the ship and he's asleep. Not just he's asleep, he's fast asleep. He's sleeping good. He's not having any trouble at all sleeping on the run from God. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, old sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Every one to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. They said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? And what and of what people art thou? Now listen to what Jonah says. He says, I'm a Hebrew. Verse 9. He said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. Apparently he shared that with them. Or they had some awful great... Spiritual discernment one. I fear the Lord that made the heaven and the sea. He made the sea and the dry land. Yet I'm running from Him. I disobeyed Him. I'm not living in His will. He's after me. For the men knew that He fled from the presence of the Lord because He told them. Then said they unto Him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous, And he said unto them, Now listen, instead of repenting, instead of Jonah saying, Well, you know what? I've messed up. I'll just repent and the storm will cease. I'll cry out, God, forgive me. No, you know what he does? He says, Just throw me overboard. I'd rather die. I'd rather, I'd rather die than to repent and obey God. I'd rather die than to do this thing that God has called me to do. That's what he told them in verse 12. Take me up. Cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for, thy, for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Now, we know what happens. The men don't want to throw him overboard. Finally, when they're left with no choice at all, overboard he goes. And the Bible says that the Lord had prepared a great fish. And I've heard many preachers stand in the pulpit and say, that he was in the fish's belly for three days and three nights. And they say that the Bible doesn't call it a whale. They need to read Matthew, the 12th chapter and the 40th verse. Guess what? Jesus calls it a whale. Amen. Jesus says that he was in the belly of the whale. So God prepared a whale to swallow Jonah. So here we find Jonah. He's messed up and he's messed up bad. It wasn't a slip of the tongue. It wasn't an evil thought that he had and didn't deal with. It was a premeditated, calculated disobedience to the command of God. And he's running from God. He chose not to obey God. He chose this. This was his fault. Let's see what he prays in the belly of the whale. Jonah, the second chapter. Beginning of the first verse. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the, belly, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods come past me about. All the billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet will I look again toward thy holy temple. Lord, I'll do different this time. Give me another chance. God, have mercy on me. 
You see, Jonah wasn't there in the belly of the whale saying, Lord, it's my fault. I deserve what I'm getting. Just let me die right here where I'm at. No, he cries out for mercy. And that's the way we are. When's the last time you messed up and you messed up bad and you was in the middle of a situation? When's the last time you fell to your knees and said, Lord, it's all my fault. I deserve this. Please don't deliver me. That's not how we work, is it? No, we pray, God, have mercy on me. I'm sorry. Forgive me. God, have mercy on me. He was there because he had disobeyed. He was there because he had sinned. He was there because he had rebelled against God knowingly, not in a moment of weakness, but a planned rebellion. Yet when he cries out, we do not find him saying, God, I deserve this. This is all my fault, so don't deliver me. Just destroy me right here. Don't have mercy on me. Lord, give me what I deserve. Give me my just desserts. I've heard that one before. I like desserts, but I don't think I want to eat that plate right there. No, we find him crying out for mercy. What do you do when you need mercy? Do you say, God, I don't deserve it. Just kill me. No, you cry out for mercy and ask him to forgive you. Jonah was like that. He cried out for mercy. Yet we will find him not too far down the road. And this should hit home with a lot of people. We find him not too far down the road. Even though when he was in a bad place, his own making, his own mess, instead of saying, well, it's my bed, let me lie in it, he cries out for mercy. Yet we will find him having a problem with God having mercy on somebody else. You see, we're all for God having mercy on us. That's not our problem. We believe in the power of God's mercy until it comes to somebody else. <clears throat> we believe that God forgives and God forgets till it comes to somebody else. Then we have a problem with it. Jonah would be the same way, cut from the same cloth as the rest of us. He would struggle with this. We find him in Jonah, the third chapter, Beginning the first verse, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Oh, aren't you glad for that? Thank God, even though he messed up and he rebelled and he did all of that stuff, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. I'm glad this morning for second chances. Amen. I'm glad this morning for third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances. I'm glad this morning that God gave Peter a second chance. I'm glad this morning that God gave David a second chance. I'm glad this morning that God gave the prodigal son a second chance chance. Amen. I'm thankful today that God has given Billy Douglas a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance. How many of us would stand before God today and say, God, don't forgive me. I've messed up before and I'll probably mess up again. So just don't forgive me. Just don't have any mercy on me. No, we wouldn't be like that between us and God, but we're like that between us and people. That's the kind of attitude Peter had when the disciples came to Jesus and said, how often should I have to forgive him? Should I forgive him seven times? And Jesus said, whoa, seven times? Yeah, but seven times 70. Over and over again. That's the kind of mercy we want from God. We want God to forgive us over and over and over. Why don't we want to forgive people over and over and over? Why do we have a problem with having mercy on others? <clears throat> or with God having mercy on others? This time when the word of the Lord comes... To Jonah, he gets up and guess what he does? He runs to Nineveh. Amen. One thing about him, he learned his lesson. As far as that part goes. According to the word of the Lord, it says, Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. Verse 4 says, And Jonah began to enter the, the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. God's judgment's coming. So the Bible says in verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from, from the greatest of them to the least of them. They begin to fast. They begin to pray for mercy. They begin to cry out to the same God that Jonah cried out to when he was in the belly of the whale. And guess what God does? God has mercy on the people of Nineveh. Jonah 3 and 10 says, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he, that he had said that He would do unto them. And He did not, that He did it not. See, His judgment was deferred because 
of their repentance. Now, later on, years and years down the road, when Nineveh would go evil again, and whenever they, they would be destroyed. But this time, the repentance, God had mercy on them. Now, this is the second act of mercy that we find in the book of Jonah. The first one, the mercy was on Jonah. Exactly, he was exactly in the place that he deserved to be, yet God had mercy. He got himself into that. He cries out for mercy. God hears him. He delivers him. And he hits the ground running. He's thankful that God had mercy on him. Now let's see his attitude toward the Ninevites. His enemies. People he didn't like. Now most of you know where I'm going with this. This is the part that most people can relate to so well today. This is the part that lets me know that we haven't really got this yet. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. What did? The fact that God had mercy on Nineveh. Why? Because he didn't think Nineveh deserved mercy. Why? Because he didn't like Nineveh. Because Nineveh was, his, <laughs> Nineveh was his enemy. They deserved judgment. They deserved what they was going to get. It was their fault. They were sinners. Oh, wait a minute. Jonah deserved what he was getting. But he cried out for mercy. <clears throat> God had mercy on him and we don't find him getting angry because God had mercy on him. We find him getting angry because God had mercy on somebody else that he didn't think deserved mercy. Lord, you don't know the terrible things they've done. Oh, yes, he did. Just like he knew the terrible things that Jonah had done. Yet he had mercy on him. Jonah had no problem with God having mercy on him. He had a problem with God having mercy on the Ninevites, mainly because he couldn't bring himself to have mercy on the Ninevites. You, don't, you want to know how important it is this morning for us to have mercy on others? The Bible says the merciful shall obtain mercy. The merciful shall obtain mercy. It teaches us those who forgive will be forgiven. It's pretty simple. You reap what you sow. Quit going around thinking, well, that one deserves it. That one don't deserve it. I deserved it. They don't deserve mercy. It's their fault. Yeah, it's all of our fault. It ain't never God's fault. It's always our fault. We cry out for mercy and He forgives. The Bible says in the sin, I'm closing. Jonah 4 and 2, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my same when I was yet in my own country? Therefore I fled from before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Where's he at? He's on that proverbial pity pot that Brother Sleese is always talking about. Then the Lord says unto, the, unto Jonah, listen to what he says. He asked him this question, and I ask you this question today too. Doest thou well to be angry? Who do you think you are to sit in the judgment seat of others that have been, that have been uh, forgiven, that have repented, that God has had mercy on for you to sit and say they don't deserve mercy. They don't deserve forgiveness. They don't deserve to be forgiven. That's God's say, not yours. We should want the same mercy for others that we want for us. There's still a golden rule today. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I mentioned the prodigal son a while ago. We all know that he took all of the money that was his part. He went out and he blew it on riotous living. He went out and he spent it with the bad boys and the bad girls. He found himself in the hog pen. He came to himself and he said, I want to rise and go back to my father's house. Even if I'm just going to be a servant, it's better there than it is here. Oh, I've been there before. Oh, my Lord. I'd rather be back there and be a servant than I would be to be here and be a slave. See, there's a difference. He said, I'll go back to my father's house. He gets back to the father's house and what happens? The father has mercy on him. He forgives him. Never even mentions his sin. The son repents and that's it for the father. That's good enough. He repents. He forgets about it. Those are behind his back in the sea of forgetfulness. But what's the older brother do? He gets mad. Let me ask you this. If the role had been reversed and the older brother 
had it been the one that went out and messed up and he came back home, what do you think he would have wanted the reaction of his younger brother to have been? Do you think he would have wanted his younger brother to reject him, to not have mercy on him? No. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If Jonah had been in the same situation as the Ninevites, let's suppose today that the Ninevites received mercy first. They didn't like Jonah. They were his enemy. He was their enemy. Let's suppose that the Ninevites received mercy first and then Jonah was the one in the terrible situation about to be destroyed by God's judgment. Do you think Jonah would have wished, well, I hope them people get mad and complain if God forgives me. I hope them people right there pray that God don't forgive me and they don't, they don't want to have nothing to do with my deliverance. No, Jonah would have wanted mercy. Just like the people of Nineveh wanted mercy. But Jonah had a problem with God having mercy on others because Jonah didn't have mercy on others. Oh, he had mercy. We all do. But it's selective mercy. We have mercy on those that we want to have mercy on. We forgive those that we want to forgive. We better grow out of that. Have you ever heard somebody say something about one of their kids? They say, well, they'll grow out of it. we got a lot of baby Christians that better grow out of some of the stuff that they're stuck in. The merciful shall obtain mercy. And God says to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry? Doest thou well to look down your nose at others? Doest thou well to sit in the seat of judgment instead of praying and having mercy on others? The same mercy that God had on you, you should want Him to have on other people. But Jonah gets angry. He gets mad. The same mercy that God afforded to him, he got mad when he afforded it to others. Can anybody here say hypocrite this morning? So we find Jonah going out on the hill, looking over the city. And the Bible says in Jonah, the fourth chapter, the sixth verse, the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd, and it withered. Jonah's shade was gone now. It came to pass when the sun did arise, and it beat down on Jonah's head. God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted, and he wished in himself to die. And said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the Lord? Listen to that. And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. And the Lord said, Thou hast had pity on the Lord. Listen to that. Thou hast had pity on the Lord. Then he tells him in verse 11, Should I not have spared Nineveh? Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein there are more than six score thousand persons? They cannot discern between their right hand and their left. And also much cattle. See that which benefited Jonah, he was all for. The gourd sprung up made him happy. He had the victory again. That's the way we are sometimes. Things are going good, we got the victory. Something turns south, we get all down and sad. Yes. He said, doest thou well to be angry? This gourd perished. It caused Jonah some discomfort. He would have enjoyed Nineveh perishing. But because God had mercy on him, he got angry. My, my, my. When well, you're talking about a staunch reality, you're talking about a, an example of mercy today. God's mercy had intervened on behalf of Nineveh the same as it had intervened on behalf of Jonah. And God said, Doest thou well to be angry, Jonah? Let me ask you today, Doest thou well to judge and show no mercy to those who you think deserve no mercy? No, you don't do well. Remember today the mercy that God had on you. Remember today that you were once in the same place and needed the same mercy. And you cried out for it and guess what? God had mercy on you. The merciful shall obtain mercy. We better get our mercy our forgiveness and our love in the right place today. We better grow out of some of these hissy fits. We better grow out of some of these judgmental attitudes that can't forgive anybody and that continues to hold their past against them because all of us have messed up. How would you like it today if God held everything you ever did wrong against you? There would be no hope for any of us. Amen? But thank God for mercy. Thank God for His mercy toward us 
And pray that God helps us to have more mercy toward others because the merciful shall obtain mercy. Someone else this morning have something?